If you're building out your perfect little Cardano Island paradise, obviously one way to get people excited about moving there is by building exciting and useful things. But you know what's an even faster way to get people to move over? Is by building bridges. Let's take a look at how we do both in the weekly report. Welcome back to Woodland Pools, your place for the latest Cardano news, tutorials, and the information you need to grow your investment with confidence. Today it's time for the weekly report, Cardano 360 edition. There's a lot to cover from the report this month, so let's jump right in. So we'll link each of these chapters below so you can watch each specific one in more detail if you'd like, but the first thing that they dove right into was a development update. So let's take a look at that. Nigel gave an update on the progress of the PAB, which just as a reminder, is already out right now in the testnet and we're all waiting for it to come to mainnet. And he also reminded us about the fact that they're working with M Labs on a CNFT marketplace that'll launch in conjunction with the PAB when it goes to mainnet. The other thing we've been hearing a lot about lately is the increase in block sizes that's coming to the mainnet. And they brought on John Woods, the director of Cardano Architecture to talk a little bit more about that. So let's see what John has to say in his own words about the block size increases that we're gonna see coming soon to the mainnet. We're increasing the block size in one go um, by 12 and percent. So that's a relatively large increase in block size. And indeed, we are increasing the memory limits for Plutus scripts on a per transaction basis by 12.5% too. So that means that we can now fit 12.5% more stuff in a block. And it means that you can effectively write a Plutus script, which is 12.5% more sophisticated. So limits on, on what you can do are starting to be uh, ri uh, raised. Um, so this is very exciting. Of course, with this, as I mentioned, we have to be careful. So we don't want to make changes that have any kind of risk of affecting the security of the network, which is really our one of our primary concerns, okay? So how do we make sure that this doesn't cause any issues? We're making these changes in, in mainnet. We're making them though uh, in in reasonably uh, moderate sizes, okay? 12.5% is, is reasonably big, but it's, but it's not too big. And we're going to be making slow and steady changes and increasing these limits until we hit our maximum throughput. So it's interesting the way that he phrased that because the idea being that yes, the 12.5% increase will help a little bit of the congestion that we're seeing with the smaller blocks, but it seems like what he was hinting at was that this might be the first of several iterations where they might slowly grow the blocks and kind of doing some fine tuning on the mainnet itself. But the important takeaway that I think we should keep in mind here is that these changes are being made to layer one directly. So we're not even talking about layer two Hydra type scaling. We're talking about direct changes that we can do to the layer one blockchain itself. So the most straightforward thing we can do is block sizes. And that's what we'll see happening here in the near future. Something to look out for to see how much does this actually alleviate some of the back pressure and some of the congestion we've been seeing on the network or how many other tweaks are they gonna have to do in the short term to try and stabilize a little bit what we're seeing when things get clogged up with these large NFT drops. The next section of the update was dedicated to the AGIX partnership. There's a lot of different elements that go into this partnership, but the part that seemed most interesting was when they were talking about the ERC20 converter of which AGIX is going to be the first coin that is used as a test on how to bring assets from the Ethereum blockchain over to Cardano. We've talked about the ERC20 converter in the past, but this time we actually get a little bit more detail on how it's actually going to work and one thing that seemed kind of interesting was when they went into detail about what the actual exchange process would look like and what the custody of that process would look like. This is the first bridge that we ever built uh, to connect two different blockchains like Ethereum and Cardano. And the way it works is that uh, you will lock your tokens in the Ethereum side and then mint the tokens on the Cardano side. And if you want to migrate back to uh, Ethereum, you will have to burn those tokens on Cardano to then unlock the tokens in the Ethereum side. That makes our tool uh, a centralized solution because there's only one uh, central authority which it needs to um, have the custody of those locked tokens on Ethereum. No? And it's a central authority that the user need to trust. But the uh, process is completely transparent and users can uh, verify on chain that their locked uh, tokens are there and they haven't moved. So that's an interesting detail that at least we hadn't heard before, that it seems that at least this first iteration of the ERC20 converter would actually be a custodial trade. It seemed like when they talked about it that it sounded like it was a non-custodial like direct swap or something like that. So 
Really curious to hear more details about how this is actually going to play out and if that's how they intend it to work moving forward for just AGIX or if this is the model they plan to use for the converter for all assets moving from Ethereum to Cardano. I would probably be surprised if they went with this custodial model as the long-term solution, but yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on this and we'll let you guys know as we hear more. From there, we continued on to friendly and familiar door for some Project Catalyst updates. Some cool stats on Project Catalyst. We see that Fund 7 is coming up. It's got 25 challenges and $8 million of funding available. And if you haven't registered for Project Catalyst yet, registration is open now. From there, we continue on with Ben O'Hanlon and the community update, but a really interesting one this time around where they focus specifically on some of the new projects coming out in the Cardano ecosystem. And it was actually a clip from a larger video that was about a 45 minute video, just diving into some of these new projects coming out We'll link that full video below as well, but to give you a high level of some of the things that we saw, the first project they introduced was Ardana, but it seems like they're looking to be a swap that is focused mainly on just stablecoin swaps. They also had on one of the co-founders of Liquid Finance talking a little bit about their project. There was someone from the Charlie project setting up to be an oracle on the Cardano blockchain. And they also had on somebody from both Occam X as well as Maladex. But the one that we wanted to point out that we thought was pretty interesting was the project being proposed by Ada Handle. You might've heard of similar projects recently gaining some traction on the Ethereum blockchain, but the whole idea of Ada Handle is for custom Cardano addresses and basically address aliases, right? So instead of you having to remember or send over your really long Cardano address. You could have just some alias address that's corresponding to you, and then people would send it to that and be able to save that instead of having to actually send to your full length address. Not much information yet. For example, if you even go to the beta sale, it just says coming soon. So we'll dig into this a lot more as we learn more about it. But of the different projects that were covered here, the one that kind of jumped out at us is like, oh, that's an interesting one that we want to look at more in the short term was this Ada handle. So we'll let you know as we learn more there. Next, they had some updates on both Plutus and Marlowe, but more from like a team standpoint of the team coming together. We could see here like all these guys all getting together and whiteboarding and stuff like that in person. Finally, after working remotely for the past 18 months, like we've all been. But we thought the most interesting thing that they talked about in this section was about the plans for Marlowe. As a reminder, Marlowe is a domain specific language. So the idea is that users who want to write smart contracts and specifically financial contracts to be able to do things like set up loans or do different kinds of specialized payments or whatever else, the idea is that somebody has a financial background but not a programming background can come in and use Marlowe to set up these financial transactions and have a template that's already set up for them and they kind of just plug and play. And the key here is that it's gonna take things like Marlowe for us to get this mass adoption that we're looking for, right? Not every solution needs to have a DEX. Not every solution needs to have smart contracts written in Plutus. If you can have some purpose-built templating for the most common kinds of loans and things like that, what do you even need a DEX for? You can use something like Marlowe, wire it up, and then just fire it off from there. So let's take a look at a couple of these Marlowe updates that they shared. This time last year, we were just beginning to think about what will it mean for somebody to run a Marlowe contract as an end user? And we, at the start of 2021, we built, went through a design process to build the Marlowe Run app. And we've built that, we've now got it running on a, a, a simulated, simulated node with the real PAB. And what we're hoping to do by the end of the year is have that running on testnet with either a light wallet or, or Daedalus. We'll see quite where we go with that. So that alone is a pretty big announcement, right? The last time we heard about Marlowe and Marlowe Run was a very sort of sandboxed environment where they showed, okay, this is how it's gonna work, but it was very much like proof of concept, like early testing days. If they can actually get Marlowe Run running on the testnet before the end of the year and integrated with Daedalus or one of the light wallets, it'll be a huge milestone in terms of how do we get things ready for lots of people to come in to be able to use this. But then he said one other thing that was even more interesting than that. We're thinking about the Marlowe Market, which will be an app store for Marlowe contracts in particular, where people can go and choose contracts, they can simulate them, they can analyze them and so on safely so that they know when they download a contract, it will do what it should do. So how cool is that? Not only is it gonna be just like a really simple thing where you can just type in, send this much, here are the terms, whatever else, but now you can actually download templates that have all of this already scaffolded for you. This is the kind of stuff that we're gonna to need to see to get mass adoption. This is the kind of stuff that we're gonna to need to see to have lots of people that come in that are not just you know programming nerds that are really excited about blockchain technology. The easier we can make it, the better it is for the ecosystem as a whole. And then they set aside an entire section dedicated to NFTs. And I do think it's interesting if we sort of take a step back and see how the IO team is increasingly recognizing how 
For better or worse, the importance and influence that NFTs are having in cryptocurrency in general and specifically in the Cardano ecosystem. They're talking about it more and more now. Josh Miller dug into like several of the NFT exchanges that already exist and some of the additional things that they're looking to do moving forward with NFTs. But the most exciting thing that they covered in this whole section here was with a team called Bondly and the product that they're building. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and we're pleased to announce this, that, that we're doing this with HK. We're building cross-chain bridge between ETH and Cardano um, for NFTs. And this is going to be a two-way bridge. We're expecting our MVP to be ready by uh, January. Um, and then our... Our beta product will be uh, coming out in Q1. Man, I feel like they kept doing this during this presentation. They were kind of just like mentioned in passing these huge things. Can you imagine this bridge being set up and now some of these huge NFT names that we're seeing in Ethereum can be brought over to the Cardano ecosystem and can be swapped for faster and cheaper and more securely in a way to capitalize on the global excitement that's going on with NFTs across all blockchains and seeing how can we start building bridges and bringing people into Cardano. Just bring your NFT with you. Come and join us, the water's fine. And then as if all those updates weren't enough, we got a recap from John O'Connor about the Africa tour that they just did with Charles. The tour was a month long across six different countries and they had 80 different meetings about different projects that they can kick off that can be utilizing the Cardano blockchain. This is just like tip of the iceberg kind of stuff since the tour just ended. It's gonna be really exciting to see how these Africa deals develop. And as we've talked about many times, if you can bring on entire nation states or large segments of these populations, this is how you get huge adoption in big chunks all at once. There are so many exciting things that are coming out in the next three to six months that it's kind of hard to even pick which one was our favorite. What are you most excited about? Let us know down below. If you wanna chat in real time, join us on Telegram. And if nothing else, we'll see you next week.